Hello everyone and, and welcome. I'm just giving a couple of minutes as a few people are just joining. Um, hello and welcome to uh, Startups Magazine and Mauser Electronics latest webinar, Money, Money, Money. Um, my name is Anna Flockett and I am the editor of Startups Magazine. And since the global pandemic has broken out, we've all had to adapt to remote working and some pretty, pretty big changes. Um, and we've been bringing you some webinars to help us through these times. And today is no different. So in this webinar, we will be talking all about finance and money. One of the things that obviously a lot of startups right now may be worrying about. So to start with, I would just like to thank our sponsor, Mauser. Um, Mauser Electronics are a worldwide leading authorised distributor of semiconductors and electronic components for over 800 industry leading manufacturers. Mauser is the go to source for engineers who need the widest product selection, competitive pricing and there's no minimum orders. They provide fast delivery and excellent service. So please do check them out and we'll be sending around some more details about them um, and details to contact them uh, in our post event mailer. So before I kick things off today, um, I have a special announcement to make as we've been working on ways to support the startup community at this time with the obviously a series of webinars, increasing our partnerships and content on the website. And now we have launched or we are launching, sorry, tomorrow, our very first podcast. Um, if you are subscribed to our newsletter, then you will receive um, all the details tomorrow. But from 2 p.m., you'll be able to find the Serial Entrepreneur um, first series available from all major streaming services. So exciting. So our focus for this series was on startups who have adapted quickly and changed um, and kind of pivoted their business model to help within the coronavirus times. And they've shifted their support. And that's been in like a number of ways. So we've had like some 3D printing of face masks and PPE equipment and recruitment startups who have shifted to focus on the NHS, um, manufacturing startup companies that obviously continue to help with the high demand in supply chains. So make sure that if you're not already subscribed, subscribe. Um, and if obviously you can do that in the post event mailer that you will receive tomorrow, um, but also just keep an ear out for the serial entrepreneur because it's so exciting. So within the next hour, we have got um, some incredible guests and some really insightful stories for you, um, as well as some helpful advice um, when it comes to raising funding. And that will include a Q&A with Albert Aziz Clawson, um, the CEO and co-founder of Underpinned, the go-to platform for freelancers and small businesses who offer end-to-end -end support. And they'll be telling us their story of raising capital. Um, and then we will have the lovely to set Don Chiva, a startup advisor who helps companies on positioning, strategy and innovation management. And today she's going to be digging into acquiring investment as a startup. Um, so before I jump into Q&A with Albert, um, I just want to let you know that there is a Q&A function at the bottom. So if you've got any questions at any time, please just pop them on there and then um, we'll get to them at the end. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy. And without further ado, I would like to um, welcome Albert but to your screen. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you today? I'm really good, thanks. How are you doing? Yes, very well, thank you. Um, so I thought to start us off, obviously we did a little intro um, about you guys, but you could just tell um, all the listeners, um, viewers, sorry, um, about Underpinned, what you guys do and kind of how your journey came about, like from being founded. Yeah, so Underpin is basically a kind of one-stop shop for freelancers, micro businesses, some small businesses, and then the clients that they have. So it's kind of an end-to-end management system where you can go from proposal to payment, um, all through one service. It's very simple, everything like contracts, invoicing, project management, portfolio development, CRM management, building a network, finding jobs. You can kind of do everything in one place and you can plug in your accounting and your insurance. It's all very straightforward. Um, I guess like a big mission behind Underpin was about simplifying that process for particularly for freelancers, but for small businesses as well. And like 
the real problem we were trying to solve was most people who work as a freelance or a small business think of themselves as kind of like two two parts of a whole one part which is the thing they love doing which tends to be the kind of business they run their craft the thing that they sell and the other part which nobody loves i guess maybe me maybe i'm the only person that loves it which is like the business admin and building a business and commercializing it and the accounting and how you make it kind of make sense as a business and so underpin was all about how do you make that side as easy and simple as humanly possible but also part of building a better business so all of our all of our kind of all of our buckets of tools are split into finding work managing work and getting paid fundamentally the things you're interested in doing finding a new job doing it well and then getting paid for it properly and all of the tools are kind of built into a user flow that makes that as simple as humanly possible and then for the clients that you work with it makes it very simple for them to kind of pay you so payments are on time and make sure that the process is all covered so you don't get stuck with things like scope creep but um I guess the journey that took us to underpin what started. So before underpin, I did business strategy consultancy for big tech companies, creative companies, um, for lots of different, actually, we're pretty broad spectrum, but it was all around operational efficiency, something that people are usually not very interested in. <laughs> uh, and then I was also doing public relations strategy consultancy, which is all about, I'm sure people know what PR is, um, all around how, build, how you're building your public narrative. And I'm also about how you relate, relate your strategy to your narratives and how you kind of make them both make sense. On the side of that, I was building a company, a media and arts company, um, and an arts charity. And the media and arts company was all about helping young and emerging artists get established and, and, and build their own work. And uh, then the arts charity was all about helping young and dis young disadvantaged and at-risk kids with creative workshops to help solve their real, real life problems. A lot about coupling artists with disadvantaged and at-risk kids and showing them how they can use creativity to solve real life problems. The kind of media and art stuff is really where Underpin was born. I think if, if people think of the people that have the biggest issue with the monetization, the business building, like the arts and artists, kind of a painter is probably the typical example of somebody who is not an obvious business person. But then if you look at the biggest artists in the world, if you take like Damien Hirst, for an example, that is like an institution. There's loads of people, there's loads of departments, there's loads of stuff going on. So if, an, if we could build the systems, if I could build the systems for artists and I started to get these questions from all these different industries, I wanted to look at how I could build a tech-led system. So it wasn't about me talking, it was about the technology talking so it could do it to loads of people at the same time. Um, how you could build a system that could make it easy for absolutely everybody and anybody. Cool. Oh, that was wow. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> really interesting. I've said it before, you can tell <laughs> that I might, I might have pitched that one a few times. <laughs> No, it sounds like a really interesting and um, eventful journey would <laughs> be the right word, maybe. Um, but focusing on obviously Underpin and what you guys do and what you've been through, I know you've recently uh, been through a very successful crowdfunding uh, campaign, so congratulations. Um, but before we dive into that, I just wanted to ask, um, obviously with the focus today being on finance and funding, how many different rounds and types of funding have Underpin been through before this one, if any? Yeah, so we have raised as a company now just about £1.5 million in total since we started 18 months ago, uh, or just over 18 months ago now. And the last raise we did was £500,000. So actually it was our smallest. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't the largest amount of money we've raised so far. But in terms of the types of funding we've done, we've done angel investment funding, we've done institutional investment, kind of like growth fund, VC style stuff. Um, and we've done syndicate funding. Um, and they're all quite different and they all kind of operate in quite different ways and have quite different approaches. I think one of the things that I've become acutely aware of and the more I talk to people in the startup industry and the more I talk to VCs and the more I talk to um, people raising capital is this idea of like a round. And I think that people put a lot of weight on this idea of like pre-seed, or friends and family, pre-seed, seed, uh, series A, series B, series C. And everything prior to series A is kind of a bit of a mess. And like, we're not quite at our series A step. Like we're in the middle of what you would call like the seed period. Um, and until you get series A, like it's quite difficult to structure those rounds really succinctly. And the only places that really do that are VCs. And the reason that they do that is that they categorize businesses by risk profiles. And the easiest way to categorize a business by risk profile is like stage of business development, which means they can have criteria to tick off as to whether or not it's relevant to them or not. And that way, if you go to a VC and they say, we do series A, then you know, okay, well, you're not going to work with a company that's not got an MVP yet. And if you go to a, a one that says pre-C, then you're going to be like, well, you're probably comfortable with working with companies that are pre-revenue and that have like relatively small traction, but have like quite a good MVP. So it's, I guess it's more about the categorization. And for us, we've kind of up until this point done like 
quite a lot of rolling rounds. So like we kind of opened a round, it took us six months to close. And then we'd open another round, it took us six months to close. And like our crowdfunding was by far our most succinct round in that everything happened in like a month. Obviously it didn't all happen in a month because loads going on before and loads going on after. But yeah. I think that it felt a lot more like an actual kind of round um, in that sense. But yeah, so we've had lots of different funding from lots of different ways and we will now be taking more, I mean, you know, we're now looking at working with VCs in a bit more, a bit more closely. Now we feel a bit more comfortable with that. Um, and we're also looking at kind of a private equity, whereas previously we've focused more on smaller growth funds and uh, private individuals. Of course. And obviously you've been through quite a few, like you said, um, different types and they, I'm guessing they've all been like a journey in their own sense, but are, are some easier than others? Mm, I think this is like, it's so dependent on your circumstance. So like there are the, the, the fastest we've ever gone from meeting somebody to them investing is like two, two days. And wow. the longest we've gone is like nine months. So, <laughs> so the, the like, and they, they, that, that, they were both individuals. So they both like should have been the same process. Right. Yeah. And, and admittedly they were slightly different amounts of money. Not, not massively actually, but the, the like, I would say that the hardest by far has been crowdfunding, but that's also because we crowdfunded at like the worst possible time in the world to be raising money from, from like middle and smaller investors. And I'll get to that in a second, but I guess like uh, private individuals is a lot about like the, the way in which you approach it is very different. So with private individuals, it was a lot about building relationships. It was getting them to trust the team. It was getting them to kind of understand the concept, just getting them to be behind what you were doing. It was a real relationship building exercise that was about, um, the, 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 and the kind of evaluation wasn't as important perhaps and the kind of some of the like itty bitty little bits of legal process weren't as important still important obviously but like there wasn't so much negotiation because really they wanted to get behind you and the team and kind of trust you to do that and maybe they wanted to be an advisor but it was a lot more about building that relationship and that can take a really long time and sometimes that can be quite quick but generally speaking i think like if you think you're raising money in less than six months you're probably probably lying to yourself like it takes a long time to raise money um and then, and you should plan for it to take even longer than you think it's going to take because it always takes longer. Um, and like the legal process after you think everything's done could take months, two months. Um, and then when we dealt with institutions, and we've only got one institutional, actually two, but one kind of formal institutional investor currently, and we've we've decided not to work with big VCs yet for various reasons. And I can go into them if you'd like. But um, and we're now starting to look at that approach. But um, when you're working with VCs, there's a lot more of like a checklist approach. So they kind of at first don't, as long as they kind of like your idea and kind of like the team, their first kind of set of criteria are quite stringent. So like, what are your metrics? Much more driven by metrics. What are your kind of like, how can you show money in, money out? How can you show your ROI? How can you show your, your cost of acquisition? How can you structure what the next six months, 12 months, 18 months are going to look like? You know, most VCs won't give you money unless you can show them you've got 18, 12 to 18 months of runway, sometimes even 24. Currently, people are really looking at longer. Yeah. And if you, whereas private individuals might be more willing to be like, yeah, I'll give you some check and see how the next six months go. And we'll kind of work together on that. Um, yeah. Definitely. And talking about, like you said, you've chosen not to go down the, um, the VC route at the moment. Um, what, what led you to that decision and kind of why? So, I mean, the, the, I'd be lying if I said like VCs have been throwing at themselves at us the whole way through this process. And it's just been like a flip and like, no, I'm not going to work with you. Cause you know, that's obviously not how it works, but um, I guess institutional money comes with strings like by and large like even if you take grant money from the government which seems like free money like there are strings there are hoops to jump through and there are strings if you work with a vc um you've got to be prepared that most vcs want to be either quite involved or come with quite strict um criteria for their investment so you're on you're never going to meet a vc that goes i'll give you 500k uh i just want to i just want 500k's worth of equity or whatever your valuation is and you know, they're much more likely to one, argue on your valuation, really want you to justify it. Two, they're much more likely to be really, really um, metrics driven. And I think there is a big difference between being a first time founder and being a repeat founder. If you have founded successful or to be honest, unsuccessful companies before that have received serious funding, chances are your process of funding is going to be significantly more simplified because people basically trust you more because you have a track record, whether that's a good track record or a bad track record, they know you know how to deal with this kind of money and you know, you, you know how this process works. If you're a first time founder, 
they don't have the trust in you necessarily as strongly. And I think that's why you see a lot of first time founders coming from financial backgrounds because they have those relationships and they can, they know how to tick those boxes. So when you look at VCs, a lot of them talk about their desire for like, you know, being part of it and like believing in the founding team. And obviously that's part of it, but a big part of it is, 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 is kind of t- checking boxes a lot more. So, so the reason that we kind of looked more to private investors is, we were, we were relatively early stage. We still are relatively early stage. And so we're looking at really building relationships with people who we can either think will be helpful or their money doesn't come with loads of strings attached and kind of bounds us up. You know, we're at a point where we know, you know, when you first start a startup, your proposition is going to change so many times. You're, you know, even at series A stage, you know, the VCs know your proposition will change as you go. And so I think we spoke to a lot of VCs. Some of them we just decided weren't right for us. The institutions didn't feel right for us. The people didn't feel right for us. The ones that we felt were right for us, perhaps it wasn't quite the right time for it, for them or for us. Um, and so there was, it was a lot about our relationship with them once we got past that, uh, that, that tick boxing exercise. But I think that when you work with a private individual, the terms are, set, are much clearer from the get-go that it's like, this money is because you believe in this idea and you want to get behind it. And there's unlikely to be crazy strings attached. And sometimes those strings can be restricting when you're in the early stages. Um, and for us, because we had such a great advisory board and we had such a great set of investors, we didn't feel we needed the added value that they brought in terms of they had this experience because we had those in advisors. So what we saw maybe a bit more so than others was money with strings attached, which we didn't feel we were quite ready for. Whereas now I've got a much better understanding of the landscape of VCs that are interested in our product and our sector. Now I feel more comfortable kind of sifting through those conversations to work out who would actually be a good partner to grow with and not just somebody that's going to give us capital. Yeah. And is it hard um, as a startup that's obviously looking for capital to kind of say no or decide they're not right for us, even it feels like you're turning down money in a sense? Is it difficult? Sometimes? I think like almost impossible for most people. So I have startup founder friends. I've got CEO friends who like have money being like thrown at them. Like I, I, I know somebody that you know, raised like three and a half million pounds just as an idea because they were previous founders and they have a lot of faith in them. And they have the ability to say no to other people, say like, no, I don't want to take the money because I can get it elsewhere. Most, especially first time founders, that's not the case. Like you're not looking at money and going, Hmm, maybe I'll take it from here. Maybe I'll take it from here. It's probably much more of like, where fuck can I get money from? Like, where can I go to get money? So no, say, and I, I actually like, while I say we haven't gone down certain routes, we've never got to, we've never let it go long enough that we've got to like, we're investing now. And we've gone like, no, the, the relationship's already always broken down slightly before then. And I think that probably is true for most cases. I don't think like, like right now, most people are probably not going to say no to any money because the difficulty in raising money has just increased massively. But I think it's not a matter of saying no to money being difficult. Because I think if you've got that far in a conversation, you're probably quite interested in the money anyway as a yeah. first-time founder. And unless you're, you're one of these people that's got like 12 VCs looking at you, then the decision to say no becomes easier. I think you're not going to be saying no to money that you need to build your startup unless there's quite serious strings attached or quite serious um, kind of implications. Of course, of course. And so um, talk, let's talk about your recent crowd, crowdfunding round, um, which you guys smashed. Um, and it was kind of all around the time, I think you started a bit before, but it was kind of still around the time when the COVID-19 pandemic came about. So obviously yeah. it's like a, an unsure time and obviously you guys like absolutely smashed it. So could you tell us a little bit more about it? And obviously what's your secret? How did you guys do it? <laughs> yeah, so I think like the first thing that I think people find it difficult to know is like when you start looking at other people's funding you always look at their successes and you very rarely look at the like vast majority of people that don't get it and i think that like statistically even within the cohort of people that made it onto the platform at the same time as us i think we were you were still statistically unlikely to succeed so like there's a huge number of people that just didn't succeed the reason that we did so well considering it was so to put this in perspective in this end of second week the dow was down 22 percent right this is when people were literally wiping their money off the table and saying we're not interested in investing and with it with crowdcube there tends to be like three types of investor you have your larger investor that might be institutions it might be vcs it might be angel investors but these are the kind of people that invest in like 50k up up to like a million pounds or up to more even then you have your uh, middle guys the kind of five to 50k people who still have their businesses they're probably not full-time investors maybe some of them are but they have like uh they have cash flow management stuff that's going on elsewhere with businesses they run and this is something that they do and then you have your, your community who 
mostly, I imagine for most companies will be investing in like 10 to maybe a thousand pounds, but mostly on the lower end of the spectrum, people who want to show their support, but maybe are not willing to put like, or don't have the money to, to put behind it. So if you take those three categories, usually the way that these are structured and obviously it's different for lots of different companies but if we get rid of like the monzos of the world and the people that had like massive massive hype around it before they started crowdfunding and look at the like reality of most businesses people see crowdfunding as like a solve all problem like i can't find money so i'm going to crowdfund and i'm going to get my community to fund me like if your community is putting an average of fifty thousand, fifty pounds in and you need to raise five hundred thousand pounds like you can do the math that's a lot of people that you yeah. need to get to invest <laughs> right we had 315 people invest and we raised over five hundred thousand pounds you do the math on that the average investment is over 10 like that's that's a lot of money yeah um so the so what you have is you have you have a starting point where you have like your bigger investors getting involved and you need to get that ready already. So if you don't have like a cornerstone of investment, you can't really start. The next part is getting your community excited, getting them involved. And they like this, this bit went really well for us. First week we hit 92, 93% or something. Um, it was going really, really well. And then like, crowdfunding like part of its like success is that it galvanizes those middle tier investors who might not otherwise have access to opportunities which there are lots of these people who might even might be putting in a thousand might be putting 10 might be putting 50 um, and they use this to find opportunities right and those people for us totally disappeared because of this so second week when we were expecting momentum to start picking up those people just disappeared. Like I think we lost 400, 450,000 pounds worth of investment in the second week alone, just from those people sending me emails saying, Hey, love what you're doing. I'm not investing in anything until like, until things clear up. Um, and I've talked to syndicates and like lots of other places where these guys invest and they've kind of like disappeared off the face. Yeah. Cause these are people who have their own businesses. That they're now concerned about. They're not necessarily looking at their five year capital of investments. They're looking at their business's cash flow as well as their current investments. It's slightly more short term. Um, whereas the small, the smaller investors from your community who like we were, that was what we were all about getting involved and we love getting our community involved and it was so exciting. But at the same time, they weren't the people we're going to raise all of our money from. Like we're still early stage. We have like, you know, 7,000 people subscribed to us. We have like, you know, 50,000 readers on our magazine. So there's, there's not like a, a, a huge number of people that are going to kind of get, get in at that point or a huge amount of money. So I think one point to note is our absolute worst case scenario happened and we still succeeded. I think what that shows is we plan for our absolute worst case scenario. And I think people go into crowdfunding with this idea that I want to raise 200,000 pounds. So I'm going to go in with 50 grand and get it up to 200 K. And like my view is that that is a terrible, terrible idea. You, you leave so much to chance. And if you fail on crowdfunding, you fail very publicly. Yeah. So we went in like, what is the minimum we are going to be able to get and be successful and raise the amount that we want to raise from what we know. And we, we that was 500 K. So like, if I'm completely honest, like publicly it was really successful and I, I, would, I don't like saying this out loud, but I, I want to be honest about it. That wasn't a, the success that we were looking for. You know, we did incredibly well in an incredibly difficult environment, but had that environment not existed, we were aiming at much bigger, right? So I think it's really important to note that you can look at it as success and it was a success in some senses, but a better way to look at it is our worst case scenario worked. And I think most people go into funding with optimistic scenarios or even just like average scenarios. And I think as pessimistic as it sounds with funding, you need to go in with your absolute worst case scenario. If you think it's going to take you three months to raise a hundred thousand pounds, then assume it's going to take you six months to raise 20,000 pounds and then be happy if it's quicker than that. Yeah. Because the truth is like it, it doesn't quite work how you want. And if you want like the secret source as it were, is that the, when we started planning this crowdfunding, we talked to our current stakeholders and our community and we worked out what it is we could actually definitely get and what it is that we could realistically bank on. And if we had tried to like bank on 800,000 pounds, so the, the reason our goal was an 800,000 pounds because overall we're raising more and we're raising it now with other places from VCs and from and over the course of the next kind of 12 months. But if we had said like our end goal for this whole seed round is 1.5 to 1.8 million, like we wouldn't have come close to what we were trying to raise because of what happened. Right. So there's, 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 I think the reality of funding, particularly crowdfunding, because it seems like such a blind, like you can't see what you're going to get. So you can get more excited about it. You need to be, I think my advice would always be, but have your worst case scenario in mind and plan for that scenario rather than from the best case scenario. Yeah. Well, Thank you for being honest. And it sounds like obviously 
it's a lot of work and that might sound stupid but I guess from the outside you don't really see how much work actually goes into it how much planning and stuff for a campaign like this does it actually take and when did you guys start thinking about it so we started thinking about this 12 months before we did it the reason it's so long because we started planning it 12 months before we did it and very much decided that we weren't ready so we were like, let's plan a campaign for, it was a year before, it was slightly less than a year before, but the planning started about a year before. We got to like the three month point where we'd been planning and preparing and we pulled it. We were like, we're not ready to do this. Let's raise our money elsewhere. Uh, let's, you know, even if it's going to be hard, even if we think it might be harder, like we're not ready for this. We need to go raise our money elsewhere. And I think a lot of people have the, the difficult position of they need to raise the money or they think they need to raise the money in some cases. And so they push it forward in the hope that it's going to be successful. But if you don't know it's going to be successful, if you can't see how it's going to be successful, if you can't count out where that money's coming from, then it doesn't necessarily exist. I think you have to be quite briefly honest about yourself, with yourself about that. So that's obviously a slight exaggeration because we thought we were going to do it and then we didn't. So there was a really long run up period, but it was two months of full, my, my 11 team, we had 11 man team looking at crowdfunding constantly every day it was about a three-week period of that was all anyone was doing except for our product team but even then they were doing quite a lot and during the campaign it was full time for the first two weeks and for the second two weeks i would say it was 50 percent of the time so that is a lot of time from quite a lot of people to yeah. do that and like as i say this is our kind of worst case scenario so maybe in our best case scenario maybe even in our like normal case scenario it would yeah. have been a bit easier but the truth is the amount of time you have to put in, the amount of uh, effort, like it looks like it's super easy on the outside, but anybody who's done marketing knows how much time and effort goes into those programs. And, and yeah. crowdfunding is just like a marketing exercise of you need to get the right people. You need to have mailing lists of hundreds, thousands of people. If you think like, how many people do you convert to a customer from a thousand strong mailing list? Maybe, maybe 10, like it's not a bad result. So how many people do you think you could convert to investing money in your company when they have to go through a process, when you invest in something, you have to answer questions saying, I understand this is highly risky. I understand I probably won't get my money back. The amount of opportunity they have to drop off is massive. So you have to think about it in like incredibly conservative terms. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of time and a lot of effort. And, you know, ultimately, obviously I had no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> and if I had, like, I yeah. wouldn't have done this. I would not have done crowdfunding if I knew what was going to happen. Okay. And I would not do it right now. But with that said, like we planned it in a way and we took enough time to go, we need to, we need to really hit our, our like worst case scenario. Are we ready for our worst case scenario? Yes, we're ready for our worst case scenario. And a worst case scenario, it sounds really negative on the inside, is still a positive story. Yeah. But it's like, what is our worst case success story? I guess is a better way to put it. Like, yeah. what is the point at which it stops being a success story and starts being a failure? And actually, quite frankly, given everything that happened, if we had raised 300K out of the 500, it probably still would have been a success story given how difficult things are. But we wanted, we, we set ourselves like a very, very strict criteria and we put a lot of planning and time into that. I, I, I think it's a success story, like you said, but obviously I can completely understand your, your yeah. point of view and, and like you said, your worst case scenario. And this may be a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, was, it, was it an enjoyable funding round at all? <laughs> um yes like there are there were massively enjoyable parts like this was a huge success in terms of our community and in terms of underpinned as an idea like forgetting the fact that a load of money people disappeared and we raised less than we were initially intending to like this was a we got huge numbers of our community behind us we got our partners behind us it, it was it was the first time i had seen such a wide scale um kind of adoption of underpinned as an idea and a concept and a thesis and a, and a and a culture and i think the amount of excitement we got from people getting like the idea of getting a button or a pair of socks about the idea of people supporting underpinned the number of like our community who called me personally and said hey i'm struggling to invest and all i want to do is put some money behind you guys i can't afford much but i want to put money behind what you're doing because you've helped so many people and you're helping us and i was like that is the nice thing I could possibly hear as a founder. And especially as like somebody who ultimately is like responsible for the boring admin behind everything. Like my team gets to run around and have fun. I and mean, I get to do this every now and again, but beyond that, like I mean, my head's in legal and accounts and like the boring stuff of, uh, 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 that I don't necessarily, I mean, I kind of enjoy it cause I'm weird, but like most people don't really enjoy. And I think that, it was, it was, I can't tell, like, I, I literally cried on multiple occasions, which this kind of sounds crazy, but like, because of how, how wonderful our community were and getting behind us. And it was, if there was ever like a shadow of a doubt that what we were doing 
wasn't working. Like this was the best way ever to get a load of people to turn around, like slap me out of that and be like, this is, this is a great thing you're doing and like keep going. And I guess also for any company, it would be a bit of a test. Like if you, if you don't get your community galvanized behind you or, or there isn't an issue, perhaps, you know, that's the time to look at your concepts and your idea and, and iterate it because yeah, it, 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 it was, it was massively successful and enjoyable from the sense of getting our community involved and raising the money that we needed, if not the money that we wanted. Yeah. Um, the only, and, and like literally the only difficulty in for us was that like one sub subsection of like those people that disappeared who are a real cornerstone of it. Yeah. But then that's also born into the fact that we, we spent a long time preparing and we put a lot of effort in. So it was, you know, it's difficult to, I think all of that effort and time that was difficult was rewarding in the end. Looking back on it, it was unbelievably stressful as well. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. And it's so great to see all your passion. Like now, we can talk about it. Even <laughs> you know, um, but yeah. Well, before I wrap up, I've just got one question, which I feel like you've touched on a little bit, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Um, do you have any advice for startups and small businesses out there now thinking about raising funds? Yes, I've got some like really like clean, clear, actionable points that I that I that I embody and that I advise people to. So this obviously varies massively depending on like if you're like a micro business that's just trying to like survive during a difficult period all the way up to like a big business who's got cash flow issues and everyone in between. But I think the general sentiment is there is less investment about like I would be lying if I said there wasn't. There are less people investing. There is a significantly less uh, appetite for investment. And like most VCs are saying we're not investing anything for at least three months. They might not be saying that publicly, but that's what they're saying to people like in conversation. So most big investment is off the table. With, so with, with that in mind, like my biggest piece of advice is if you can have the luxury of kind of locking down, use this period for narrative building. The best way to get investment is to create a sense of FOMO. If investors think they're going to miss out on investing in you, they will not. Like people say it's not an emotional exercise. It is an emotional exercise. Even for VCs, VCs do not want to miss out on a deal. So if you can say, we're actually not accepting any money for three months on the basis that you know that no money really exists, then you can go, let's spend three months building like a progressive narrative and constantly remind potential investors that this narrative is being built. So when in three, four, five, six months, we decide we're going to go and get investment, we turn up to these guys being like hey you've been following us for six months and you've seen how much progress we've made like we're talking to about 12 people what do you think about this so that's one thing the other thing is if you can stop thinking about raising money for a second and start thinking about how you can lock down your finances for 12 months and or look at alternative revenue streams so one of the biggest pieces of advice startups are getting at the moment is get a 12 month runway whatever it costs get a 12 month runway and it might sound brutal and like you know we've cut costs just to make sure that we've got a 12 month runway even though we raise money and even though we're looking to raise more money this summer and we're having good conversations on the basis that we're working on the assumption and it might be a pessimist assumption but again it's the worst case scenario there is no investment for six months that's our worst case scenario then it takes six months to raise our first bit of cash which means from our worst case scenario from our like pessimistic perspective we cannot afford to be reliant on investment over the next 12 months. Now, most businesses are probably not in that situation. And if you're an early stage business or you're pre-funding still, then start to look at how you can be building that narrative. The final thing is, which I know we're gonna talk about it later, but I thought I'd touch on is, go through a checklist of what is available to you. Because some VCs, if you can show that your startup has actually been improved by coronavirus or COVID-19, which might sound like, and you, you should, the way you phrase it is important, you don't wanna sound like you're jumping on coattails, but if you can show that your startup is actually something that will thrive in this environment, VCs currently have a lot less opportunity and investors currently have a lot less opportunity because most businesses are struggling. If you can show that you're one of the businesses that actually can take advantage of this and actually can help more people, and I, you know, use, using the phrase take advantage sounds quite negative, but you know, for us, we've used this as an, as, a, as an opportunity to support way more freelancers to make our services free, to, make our, to produce loads of resources. If anyone wants to check it out, please do. But I kind of, maybe the startup community might not be the right, right demographic. But if you can go through them, there are grants available and there are some people who are looking specifically, go through a checklist, if you don't meet any criteria double down on lasting as long as you can and or and or revenue um and build a narrative around that yeah that's it <laughs> no that was amazing i love your tactics as well um it's been great chatting to you i'm conscious of time but we've got a couple of questions so i'll, I'll ask you one and um, we've got time to ask the other um hethi said um it makes me feel as a sole trader slash i own my own business startup that if i take that much an 11-man project i'd never be able to succeed in crowdfunding do you feel like it's possible or worth the stress 
that if I take that much, I'd never be able to see. I'm not sure I 100% understand the question. I, if you're asking whether or not crowdfunding itself is worth the time or money, because because bear in mind, like we were raising a relatively large amount. If we were raising like 50k to get things going, it wouldn't have taken an 11 man team that long, perhaps. But and also, as I said, like we were planning for our absolute worst case scenario, and so that required the biggest buffer humanly possible. If you think our crowdfunding survived the largest global crisis since like the Great Depression in terms of business interruption. Yeah. that's like the fact that we succeeded is like put it within that context for a second like we were aiming like at real stars so i think like you that in a, in in better climate that's not it, it wouldn't be the kind of like war level battle plan that it needs to be at the same time i, I do think you should plan for your worst case scenario in terms of worth and stress i think the best way to think about this and this is really really important is whenever you look at any funding op opportunity or option in the same way whenever you look at any sort of operational model then you should first think do i actually have line sites on it because if you're looking at crowdfunding as a way of getting money because you can't find money elsewhere maybe there's an issue with something else that's not necessarily the funding um if you are a sole trader at, or slash you own your own uh, startup, take a look at Underpin because actually we've got loads and loads and loads of resources and we've made everything free until September um, for, for sole traders particularly. So take a look and see if you can help. And if you ever want to get in touch, I'd be happy to answer your questions about how it worked for us in, in more detail. But basically speaking, I think don't look at it as an option that will solve your problems. Look at it as another way of getting funding that has its own steps. And if you can find it elsewhere or you don't need it, then maybe it isn't worth it. If you don't need the cash, then I think it definitely isn't worth it. Amazing. Well, Albert, there is a couple more, but I'm really conscious of time. So we might come back to them at the end, if that's okay with you. Cool. And if they, if we don't get to do that, if I know Emily's in the chat, she's my head of community. Oh, and she's going to okay. send an email. And yeah. uh, if you want to get in touch directly and you can't, I can't answer your question now. I'm, I, I'm put, I put aside time every day, put aside some time every day to talk to our community. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. It's been great chatting to you. And thank you. Are you necessary? Don't necessarily. So uh, it was a genuine, genuinely exciting to see a success story especially thank you very much <laughs> um now to everyone i would like to um introduce you all to to Svet as she takes your screens to discuss what has changed for investors and financing in the uk when it comes to being a startup or freelancer looking to raise so Svet, it's all yours thank you uh, thank you anna for having me and uh, welcome to uh, everybody here I had prepared a presentation, so I think it would be easiest if I just share it on my screen right now. But I think a lot of things have changed. Obviously, you are very much aware of that. And um, Albert uh, covered some of the very interesting points about, um, I guess, how from his perspective, the market has changed, how um, investors are looking at uh, different deals, Actually, there is a lot of, um, there is a difference between, um, you know, depending on the region, depending on the sector that you're in, what are the opportunities right now. Essentially, you have to understand as well that um, venture capital is, um, in a way, you are mitigating against risk. So obviously, right now, the risks, uh, it, the risk is much higher. But I hope that with the presentation, um, it will kind of give you a little bit more of an understanding of the market right now, and perhaps um, also to speak about agility and to speak about pivoting a business. And this could help you kind of have an overview within where you are in your current situation and what are the steps that you need to take before you actually go and fundraise, whether that's going to be with venture capital or with um, angel investors or as a crowd crowdfunding campaign. Um, so a little bit about me, yes, uh, I'm, I'm an advisor and a mentor, but before that I used to work at a venture capital firm that is focusing on prop tech investments um, and also um, before that and in parallel in some ways I was at a London Connect Connectory which is an urban mobility co-creation hub uh, by Bosch in partnership with TFL, so very much involved with um, in, uh, kind of understanding what the new uh, solutions are in prop tech and mobility and also where they fit within the larger um, market. So obviously right now there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of changes in the global economy and the shock is real. Uh, some people are comparing the current situation with 2008 um, from my understanding Again, I have not been, uh, obviously I've not been working at that time, but I hear that it's uh, much more comparable with 2001, 2000 uh, and to the 2000s where there was a freeze in the market um, in 
uh, in a lot of uh, investments. Um, right now there is no freeze, but definitely the pace has slowed down. And I think there is a difference between um, how the VCs perhaps are um, behaving in Europe or how they are investing in Europe and what is the difference with um, the firms that are investing in from the US side. Um, so uh, back to, I, I will uh, touch upon that in a little bit later on, but right now uh, uncertainty is the issue because we don't know how long this uh, situation will last. Will it be for another three months? Will it be for another 12? So it's all uh, very much a hypothesis based uh, with what is going to happen right now. But you have to also understand that each VC is different in, in the way that they're looking at new investments. Um, they have to, first of all, they have to raise themselves. <laughs> uh, and I'll uh, touch upon the structure later on, but you have to um, kind of do your own research and use this time wisely. Albert mentioned to focus on product, that's a great idea, and also focus on building the relationships right now. If VC is the way that you want to go ahead with, it's a good time to be building relationships with investors. Um, so obviously some sectors are more affected than others. Uh, urban mobility and prop tech are the ones that I chose because these are the ones that I understand best, uh, but, um, Urban mobility uh, example is uh, Lime that currently is operating only uh, kind of fo focusing its effort on only one city out of 30. Uh, and they are um, using the time right now to, um, re to uh, change, uh, perhaps to um, be prepared for when the change um, has uh, come to a more, um, uh, has come to kind of like a state that they can be active again and thinking about how they can engage with uh, the users. How can um, they, for example, use this behavior shift that right now is taking place and actually work on it and see um, and basically use it um, at this first moment that they can to their advantage. So that's a very good strategy to kind of think about what is, uh, what would you do once that this situation is finished? Yes, right now we are in a shock and uh, this is what it what the state is uh, right now, but think about what will happen once we are out of it as well. Um, and um, yeah, just some brief stats about the FinTech market, because I know that this is a FinTech uh, focused, um, uh, focus webinar. So obviously it's a more favorable market because of um, the, uh, all the activity that has been taking place since 2008. Uh, there is uh, some uh, positive and some obviously some negative to the current situation. So for fintech in specifically, um, I have taken out some stats about the related to the um, uh, coronavirus business interruption loan scheme and how fintech companies uh, have uh, pushed to, to get accredited from the British Business Bank in order to provide these loans and Starlink, Oak North and Funding Circle have been successful uh, not yet processing the loans but this is still a very big development and the re, um, one of the benefits that coronavirus will have in a lot of sectors is pushing and um, fa fastening the digitization uh, so I think in fintech obviously uh, that will that has already been a lot more advanced than in other sectors, but will uh, increase. And uh, it's not some it's not something new that people are switching accounts and going into fintech solutions. Uh, but for the last three months alone, for example, uh, of 2019, there have been uh, above 30,000 um, changes uh, for first-time user accounts. So obviously, this is a sector that is um, quite well developed, positioned to do better than others but definitely what is happening right now will be a catalyst because first of all, there's going to be new habits of so people want to get solutions on demand, fintech solutions on demand and quicker. And also um, um, consumer spend will uh, drop, not only in, um, if you think about it, for example, hospitality and retail are very affected, that this will not affect, um, what is happening now is not going to affect only hospitality and retail, but it will have a follow on reaction with, um, other sectors because of this change in consumer spend and you have to take uh, this into consideration whenever you are you could be not as affected right now as a startup but think about what will happen when your clients are not as um, you know as not bigger uh, they don't spend as they did before um, so yeah again some stats that um, right now I'm not in a VC but I'm in constant communication with VCs so just um, you know 
for valuations. This is going to um, this is going to perhaps take place. A very big challenge for fintechs will be regulations. I think that is one of the areas that you cannot that will slow down right now because of what is happening. And that will have if you are in the fintech space and if you are fundraising, uh, yeah, you have to be mindful of uh, regulations. Um, yeah, basically, I've great stats uh, here. So uh, recently, and I have to be mindful of time, but recently um, there has been um, a survey that, there has been a lot of surveys actually. That's, I think that's the good thing because it's so new. It's such a new situation. Everybody is trying to make sense of it. And I know, including me in the very beginning, uh, everybody was talking at the first, the first, I think, few days, uh, you spend so much time communicating with people from the industry and understanding what they're seeing, what they're doing, how are they approaching their portfolio companies. So back when this was taking place, I was, um, I was still at a VC. And you know, there are so many, um, there are so many groups that you uh, can exchange information to. And the first um, focus for a lot of VCs was their portfolio companies. That was the, that was the immediate focus and trying to uh, kind of um, help them to the best way that they can. Um, and um, a survey that came about was done. Uh, actually, I think it came. Uh, this it came. It came out this week, but it was done uh, by Local Globe and other VCs, and they had surveyed about 200 respondents about what are the challenges that they're facing right now. What is the implications? Uh, these are some of the stats that came up. Obviously, startups are very agile, and that's great because. Um, it is adapting to the changing environment. So these are some of the interesting uh, questions, for example, that they are asking from investors. I think that's a benefit right now that if you do have an investor um, and it is um, it is a way to uh, you know ask for, even if, you, of course, a lot of startups would, want, uh, would need uh, the financial backing, but uh, it is also an opportunity to ask for advice. And this is, uh, if you have an angel investor or if you have a VC investor, it's really uh, very helpful in situations like that where you don't know how to navigate um, the route forward. Uh, so I'm going to, I think I'm not going to have too much time to focus on every slide that I, that I had prepared because I have a lot, but uh, change is imminent uh, and uh, the challenge is that realistically, um, in uncertain situations, um, it is heightened the uh, kind of the the need for uh, the need for almost looking for something that you know is heightened. So, uh, it, with innovation in mind, uh, it is an opportunity as well as a challenge. And uh, from agile, and I did put a little bit about agility because you are you need to be um, in your startup. You need to be adapting to what you are seeing right now. And if you are fundraising, one of the first things that you need to do is being able to respond to the changing environment. And that doesn't mean to, uh, not every startup should pivot, but it means to understand what is uh, what is the what is currently taking place and how you should behave and how you should adapt in order to um, de deliver the same value to your clients. For example, if you already have um, clients, deliver the same value in order to, um, yeah, for example, weather the, weather the storm as, um, as some companies need to do. And uh, you, this is uh, obviously very relevant for more, for bigger, uh, for bigger startups that already have um, you know, several members of staff that already have some uh, traction perhaps, uh, and they're, because startups are very agile as well, and they're quite um, lean on staff as it is. But if you are from these companies that is slightly bigger and you are going through, for example, you've been through one fundraise, you're going through another, um, and you are right now in a position where you are working completely remotely, there is a lot of things going on, obviously a big change. So think about whether your company, first of all, is to the state that it needs to be, uh, and whether there is, um, this kind of engagement that you need within the team, because I think that's first, uh, that's very key. Uh, and some of the challenges that small and big companies are uh, experiencing right now is, you know, there is a, a lot of, uh, uh, there's, for example, one is uh, very obvious, but um, there's a lot of uh, projects that everybody is working on, and yet at the end of the week or at the end of the month, nobody has um, actually achieved, uh, you know, measurable progress or they're like what are the results that are that we want to uh, have as uh, accomplishments rather than everybody just working on multitasking and nobody has a clear focus that is a very big problem uh, and you as the founder or as a manager you have to make sure that um, you put this 
processes in place, uh, and you have to be, uh, you have to ensure that um, you are, you come out of this as a good leader. Uh, and it's really important. Uh, I cannot stress it enough how important it is to, as a founder, to be able to lead your team throughout this situation. Um, pivoting. So, what is pivoting? Um, it's not. Um, you know, it's not changing the entire um, structure. It's not changing, for example, the um, the direction of the business. And it's not something that should be, you know, taken whenever there is a problem with the business model. But right now, what you need to do is to understand what is taking place and to adapt your solution. And that's really important when you're looking for investment, because this is a key metric that uh, investors will look at is to how have how has what is happening now with coronavirus affected you? And um, be, uh, be transparent and be uh, open to that because um, I think one of the worst, uh, one of the worst uh, statements or one of the worst answers that is heard right now is, oh, coronavirus uh, didn't have any impact <laughs> on my business. Well, that's just, uh, that's just not, um, that, that's not transparent and also it's not going to uh, be taken with, um, you know, everybody knows that that's not true. Um, so the present outlook, um, if you are uh, in your current position, uh, what is uh, the kind of wider industry? Is it going through a slowdown? Is it going through a massive growth? You could be from the companies that are in a beneficial position right now. Um, but uh, again, try to adapt. If you, are, if you do need to adapt, try to adapt to the value of your customers and to, be, um, to make sure that you are as relevant as possible right now before you seek out further contact and before you seek out um, uh, contact with investors or if you are already in the process make sure that you adapt your solution as a first uh, so some uh, examples recent examples that have taken place this is again more related to prop tech but uh, very relevant to how quickly companies have been able to adapt a really interesting one is with um, juke uh, it's a modular housing company that has started kind of developing solutions for um, hospitals, modular hospitals. So obviously right now, if you could provide essential services or if you could provide essential product, that would be a great, um, yeah, great opportunity. What has Starling done is that they have done a connected card and um, this could be controlled by you if you, um, if you want to, um, for somebody to stay, uh, to help you with, um, essential needs essentially and you are staying at home. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to flip through those um, because it is more about your internal company and we are, we have to focus on, you know, getting the external investments, but if anybody wants to um, have this presentation, I can forward it afterwards. Um, but uh, one of the first things that you should do as well as like a more practical tip as a startup is to prepare and to Kind of pre-plan your uh, scenarios. This is something that I've taken from Sequoia. They had a post around that, but essentially you need to look, really drill into the business and see what are the uncertainties that you're facing. How will, uh, you know, just make a plan that is um, from best case scenario to worst case scenario uh, and have, a, and take everything into consideration of what is happening around you because um, you are, whatever, uh, whatever your business is, whatever sector you are in, you're not operating in silos. So you have to be very mindful of the external environment. And when you are, if you are fundraising and if you are um, speaking with investors, it's very clear and it's very important if you could tailor your pitch in order to cover the first order effects that will happen for the company. So that is the immediate effects that are happening right now. For some companies, it's very good or for um, you know they wouldn't see so much change into what they're ha what is happening if you are let's say a uh, consumer not even serious service but if you're um, uh, e-commerce business and you are uh, you know set, um, doing uh, in the business of uh, let's say goods that people would you know just be ordering online this right now obviously everybody is spending a lot of time online so it could have even a positive effect but what happens when these people stop you know it, there there are so many jobs that are being lost right now so what happens when this consumer spend stops right this is going to be the second order effect that you should consider and how is uh, this going to impact your business in the next let's say five months uh, and yeah, definitely cover this in the pitch. Uh, it would be um, very beneficial. But before you are going to the pitch as well, take this as action right now. Reduce burn rate and expand runway. Everybody's talking about that. So uh, I'm sure that if you are a founder, you have 
probably read so many articles on that uh, freeze hiring even though you could uh, if you're in a position to hire, you could get really uh, good people right now because they're just, you know, un unfit. The, the situation is unfair and you may get a very good talented people right now. But if you do not need to hire, then don't uh, fill out the uh, positions that you would have otherwise. And if you are, again, back to my point about agility and internal organization, if your team is um, engaged and good, then um, they wouldn't mind, actually, they wouldn't be the ones that would volunteer taking more responsibilities. Uh, but yeah, ensure at least, at least, at least six to 12 months runway and take the siege of action now. Um, look at your expenditure. Uh, yeah, again, about the first order and second order effects, but, um, what um, Albert said about the narrative is really important. Yeah, so um, you have to define your narrative as well and uh, see what is uh, what is the USP essentially when you are approaching anybody. What is the USP of your business? And maybe your USP of your business has changed. Uh, but why has the VC activity slowed down? Obviously. Um, different firms are uh, deploying capital in different ways some are let's say corporate vcs that are deploying capital completely differently than vcs that are let's say with a um, different structure and um, they are raising um, externally let's say external rounds uh, but um, uncertainty is obviously a very big issue the bar is higher uh, a lot of VCs will not look at markets that are not, not well known. Uh, they will be looking for like more comfort sectors, the experienced teams with previous relationships and companies that ha they have been tracking for a while. I think that's one very um, key um, kind of key area that a lot of uh, VCs right now, if they had been in touch with a company that perhaps was in a valuation that they wouldn't agree with because up until now, the valuations were very much in favor of the founders. Uh, that um, that is a good way so if you had for example if you are in a position where you already have a good relationship with the with a vc uh, definitely reconnect with them right now uh, but and there will be a reduction in valuations it could range from 10 up until 40 percent but to be fair vcs are in business of the multiples of the high 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 multiples so really you know even even if they for, for them, for a lot of fair VCs, they wouldn't really um, you know, push the founder to a valuation if it is you know, 10%, 10 that's in the long term, in the, in the long term strategy, that is really a negligible, like a valuation of 10%. Um, so uh, which VCs are investing right now? I guess that's a very, um, first of all, before approaching VCs, map out your um, kind of like have a, um, almost do a research of which are the VCs that are active, which are the VCs that are investing in your sector, and then try to map out uh, who the active ones would be. Uh, and how would you do that is, um, first of all, there is a lot of resources, and perhaps I can share after at least one that um, is um, kind of like an open table where every VC that is investing in Europe has kind of put their coordinates and uh, you know the person that you should reach out to. Um, very uh, a lot of them would not be as um, as honest and as open uh, as to how much uh, they're actually looking for um, new investments because as i mentioned once again uh, a lot of the support will go to portfolio companies and that's completely normal and that's actually you know if you are if you are partnering up with a vc essentially you are with them for the long term right so you want to see that there is this commitment from, from this vc and uh, you want to um, this is a this is a good sign. This is a good sign. But um, if you are mapping out the uh, firms, look for when they raised last, and um, kind of I would say target a VC that is in your sec investing in your sector, investing in your um, stage. Uh, so don't approach VCs that are investing in Series B if you are an early early stage startup, uh, and also see um, you know who you can calculate the amount of money they have more or less, you know, available kind of to see on uh, how um, how far they are in their journey because you would know how, for example, what is their average ticket size. Um, um, what, is, what is the average ticket size that they would normally put in and also, um, yeah, kind of do the math and you'll be able to see more or less from the last phrase, like how, how far they are into that. Um, but um, how do I approach VCs? Uh, I guess 
you know, there, there is no, uh, first of all, whoever you approach with a code outreach, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, somebody for your business as a client or as a partner, uh, I don't believe in code outreach as well. So if you have a, like a template email that you would just send out to any type of VCs, that is just not effective. And I don't, um, I don't um, recommend this. Um, and even before I went into VC, I was actually a prop tech startup. So what I had done without anybody telling me is I would, uh, you know, research not only the VC firm. So yes, that's very relevant that you have to obviously be approaching the right VC, but I would be um, researching the person that I want to approach from this VC because you cannot really build a relationship before, um, you know, focus on one person, let's say, from this firm that you want to build a report with and also uh, find perhaps like some common, um, common uh, areas of interest that you could bring up in your uh, first intro email. Uh, right now, there is not, obviously a lot of people are spending time at home. So uh, even though the emails are fuller with portfolio company um, work, as, as you are spending time at home, you are reading through your email a lot more. It's a very, actually, it's a very uh, good time to try to get through the door and to try to start building this report with VCs that you would otherwise not have the opportunity with. Yes, there is no offline uh, events right now, but uh, think about it like even if you were to go to this offline event, how, uh, how um, kind of common would it be for you to actually be, to actually meet with this person and um, create the connection? Not very common. Whereas right now, at least you could create like this initial contact. Um, so pitching on online, a lot of people are asking uh, questions on that and are kind of um, want to find out more about pitching online and pitching on Zoom. And it's new for everybody. Obviously, this is a new environment for both VCs and for startups uh, alike. And uh, some VCs are more equipped to work remotely than others. But um, in essence, when you're doing anything, whether it's a presentation that is uh, online or offline, you have to prepare for it uh, and you have to make sure that you uh, have um, perhaps even repeatedly uh, said your pitch a number of times in order to ensure that at least this is there and the delivery is something that you should not um, worry about. Obviously, send the deck in advance. Uh, I think that's quite straightforward because you don't, for one um, you know, technical issue less, uh, that would just be, you know, whenever you're starting, you can just ask um, the people who are um, looking through the deck to open it up on their computers and that just minimizes the whole stress of you know screen sharing fail and things like that so uh, what are the areas to focus on as well once you if you have sent your deck over already you can ask um for any am i running out of time i'm running out of time okay <laughs> i didn't cover i didn't cover too much okay um let me see the key things um Okay, so early stage investing, very quickly, early stage investing, the, at least 50% of the decision will be on you because there is little, very little evidence, very little um, product uh, to back it with and very, uh, and even revenue right now, there, are so many, there is so much uncertainty. So uh, very quickly, if you are, um, the, the team, the team uh, is very important. So background is super important. If you have the background, it doesn't really matter if you are, have been, yeah, of course it helps if you have built a successful business before, but if you have the domain expertise, bring this slide up uh, for team background. During the pitch, I'm going to be very quick, Anna, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna be very quick. Um, so small talk, uh, if you are doing an online pitch, start with a small talk, start with, you know, um, it's kind of trying to um, get an understanding and also try to connect with the investor uh, because Keep in mind, they're also spending time at home, right? They're also wanting to, um, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to build a report and um, present the budget plan. Make sure that you factor in what is happening right now with coronavirus within your pitch. Uh, have, have empathy, have, ask, ask for feedback. That's super important and could help, can only help you going further. Um, and uh, yeah, show, the, show that you understand how this environment is affecting you. And investors know right now you do not have a clear vision of what is happening and they don't expect you to have, you know, all the answers because they don't have them themselves. But um, just uh, show that you have factored this in. Uh, very quickly about alternative uh, financing. There is right now an announcement about the future fund. You could Google it online or you can reach out to me if you have, 
if you know if I could help you with that, but it's very straightforward. The issue is that the criteria is not as clear, so um, there is very you know little things that you could um, you could read it yourself, but uh, in essence, the criteria is not yet uh, so fine. This is something that is new: bounce back loan scheme. Read, uh, check it out. Coronavirus job retention scheme. Yes, if you have already, um, you know, certain metrics that you cover, you could put your staff as furloughed. Right now, very quickly, seed or proceed are pre-seed are not that they may take longer, but you know, it's definitely uh, something that is still taking place, and uh, investors are investing depending on the fund that they're in and depending on the allocation that they have available. Uh, just very quickly, um, you know, there is uh, there is little understanding, I think for some uh, areas of how the industry works, um, but keep in mind that uh, VC doesn't just have this um, all amount of money available and they can just write checks immediately. A lot of time, I mean, once they have written a term sheet and once they have submitted the term sheet, they also have to get, uh, you know, they are doing this kind of capital call to the LP and the LP is the person or the entity that invests within a VC. A VC has at least one LP, a lot, uh, some and most of, VCs have a lot more. Um, so yeah, um, be transparent. Again, what is the impact of uh, coronavirus on your business? Be open that you don't know the variables, but make sure that you say that you are aware of the risks. So when will the VC activity be back to normal? Yeah, um, very straightforward. You could read it. Um, it very much depends on how the situation in UK and in Europe will uh, span across. Okay, Anna, I'm, 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 <laughs> perhaps there is a few questions as well. So the, um, yeah, I don't know if there is a few questions, but we um, we have run out of time. Um, but we we can um, connect you with people, and obviously, if we want, we can include your slides in the post event mailer so everyone can see the slides. Um, if that's okay. they were not very pretty slides. <laughs> Oh, sure. I really enjoyed them. It was really great to, you know, learn more about the industry. And obviously, I could listen to you all day. We'll have to get you back on because there's obviously just so much to talk about. Um, but with a bit of slight change in the order today, uh, thank you again, Svet. Um, with the slight change in the order today, we thought that we would just finish um, after a full-on session with a five-minute um, mindfulness session with Gabby, our partner from Open Mind Wellbeing. So, Gabby, thank you so much for being here and about the confusion and take us away that's all right thanks so much anna and uh thanks for having me Hopefully the audio is okay back to close things off instead which after uh listening to quite a bit of the presentations today and talking about money and kind of know how much that can stress people out it's probably almost better that it's at the end for anybody who's still here and sticking around um so funnily enough our our small startup is also doing seed at the moment so that was quite interesting for me because we're uh, we're looking for money too <laughs> But we're uh, we're on the on the side of people being interested in, in this uh, time, which is you know good, but unfortunate in these times that it has to come from that. Uh, but so we're going to do a, a little breathing exercise, and the breathing exercise, a little bit of um, mindfulness, is really around just kind of letting stuff go. So you might have found that throughout the session, tons of really useful information, and you know great talks by both. Albert and Sveta, and, but you, you could find that your stress levels might have gone up and up and up and up because you're thinking now and talking about a lot of money stuff, which is really important and underpins things. So maybe we just take this time to settle down a little bit. So sitting up nice and tall when you're ready, you know, open up the shoulders a little bit, maybe even exaggerate it, find that little chest opening, roll the shoulders there. And then when you're ready, I'm gonna get you to take your right hand and just place it on your chest. So just right up there. And the other hand, you can't see me, but just place it down on your belly for a moment. We're just going to feel our breath there. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you at this point. If it's not, just pick a little gazing point in front of you. But otherwise, just draw the eyes closed. And as you draw them closed, start to just let your awareness to draw inwards a little bit, maybe noting whatever feelings, sensations you've got going on there. And then just starting to notice your breath and using our hands to do that, maybe feeling the belly and the chest expanding and then contracting as the breath comes into the body, everything lifts and expands. And as the air leaves, everything relaxes a little bit, contracts, let's go. Now what I'm gonna invite you to do is we're gonna do this little breath technique. 
I'm going to inhale just nice and deep, just a normal inhale. On the exhale, see if you can breathe out, feel your belly draw in, but keeping your chest nice and steady. And then just a nice deep inhale again. This time, exhale, just the belly, keep the chest nice and stable. And then about halfway, just pause for a moment. And release the rest of the way, exhale, and just allow the chest and the shoulders to relax fully. So a nice deep inhale. Exhale just from the belly, about halfway. Pause. And then exhale, release the chest, the shoulders, everything. Just let the rest go. And take a couple more of those breaths. Inhale, nice and full to your comfort, so not too far. And then allowing just the belly to draw in the first half of the exhale. Pause for a moment in the middle. And then release the rest of the air and just let the chest, the shoulders relax as you do that. Let's take a few more of those. Inhale fully. Exhale, just the belly halfway. Pause, maybe a little longer. And exhale, release everything. And then last two like that together. Nice deep inhale. Exhale the first half. Pause in the middle, and then sigh, release the rest. And last one here together, inhale. Exhale the first half, drawing the belly in. Pause in the middle. And exhale, just release the rest. And then let the hands just draw down into your lap. Maybe place the palms down on the thighs. And just let your awareness just settle into the rhythm of the breath, hopefully. Let's calm down just a little bit, even if it's just a fraction. And just to close, we're going to take one nice deep breath together, inhaling nice and big. Open the mouth and really sigh it out. Let's just take one more. Deep inhale. Open, nobody can hear you. Sigh it out. Good, and then just let the natural rhythm return. And then maybe take your left and right palms together. Give them a little rub. And take the palms over the eyes for a moment. And then just allow the eyes to open up under the palms. Maybe spread the fingers a little bit, let a bit more light back in. And then just releasing them down when you're ready. And just let the space around you come back in. Thank you very much for letting me lead you through that. Thank Hopefully you. it helped a little bit. <laughs> that was amazing, especially after a long week um, stuck in the house in isolation. It was um, it was really nice. It's, I think I needed it. I think probably a lot of people did. <laughs> oh good. I'm glad thank, Anna. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for joining us and sorry about the uh, slight confusion again but I think it was really good having it after all the heavy talk and stuff. So like you said it was right a nice way to finish well thank you to a massive thank you to gabby a massive thank you to our guests and um, svet and albert it was amazing having you all on and learning so much it's been a full-on session um and again a massive uh, thank you to mauser electronics and please do check out their details on our mailer tomorrow um, just a quick one before we leave. I know we've run over. I'm so sorry. Uh, a massive thank you to all the participants that have joined us today and all my team for helping. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I genuinely have. Hopefully we'll be able to get together for a real life event soon enough. Um, and remember two things. Look out for your post event mailer tomorrow um, and check out our new podcast launching tomorrow at 2 p.m. Very, very, very excited. But for now, thank you. Goodbye. And we'll see you again in two weeks time.